Jihad comes from the Arabic word jahada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. And in Islamic terminology, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle where there's oppression. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in self-defense. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield. So jihad basically means to strive, to struggle. For example, if a student is striving and struggling to pass the examination, in Arabic we would say that he is doing jihad. And many of the non-Muslims, including many of the Muslims, they believe that jihad can only be done by Muslims. There are several verses in the glorious Quran talking about jihad done by non-Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14. وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَحْنًا عَلَىٰ وَحْنًا وَفِصَالُهُ فِي أَعْمَيْنِ that we have enjoined upon man, kindness to his parents. His mother bore him with weakness upon weakness and gave birth to him with weakness. The image at next verse, Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 15. وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَحْرُوفًا and if the parents, they strive and struggle to make you worship others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then do not obey them, but yet live with them with love and compassion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats a similar message in Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 8. That you have enjoined upon man kindness to his parents. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about non-Muslim parents who are striving and struggling to make their children worship others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is called jihad fi sabil shaitan. And what we Muslims should do is jihad fi sabil Allah. But normally when the term jihad is used, it is taken for granted that it is jihad fi sabil Allah, unless it is specified. Many non-Muslims, including many of the Muslim scholars, inverted commas, they translate jihad as holy war. If you translate this word, holy war into Arabic, it means Harbum Muqaddasah. Nowhere is this word Harbum Muqaddasah present in the glorious Quran or the authentic Hadith. So jihad basically means to strive to struggle. One type of jihad is qital that is fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But jihad does not basically mean a war. Jihad basically means to strive to struggle. And if you look at the history of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first 13 years of prophethood during the Meccan era, there were several verses revealed talking about jihad, but the sahabas, they never fought physically fighting. It was later on when they went to Medina, there the wars took place. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah al Habut, chapter number 29, verse number 69. And those who strive in our ways, we shall surely open up their pathways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah al Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 52. فَلَا تُطِعِ الْكَافِرِينَ وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا But do not follow the unbelievers, but strive 
with them utmost strenuously with the glorious Quran. Do you mean to say you're going to fight with the glorious Quran? It means that you have to strive and struggle to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims, to those who are unaware of it. So here we realize the misconception regarding the word jihad earlier it wasn't there. But after 9-11 it has come at the top of the charts. So depending upon how the media it portrays Islam, these misconceptions they arise in the minds of non-Muslims. The second misconception is that Muslims are fundamentalist. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist by definition means a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion. For example, for a person to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow and strive to practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a person to be a good scientist, he should know, follow and strive to practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending upon which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. For example, there is a fundamentalist robber. He's a bane for the society. On the other hand, there is a fundamentalist doctor. He's a boon for the society. As far as I am concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Because I know and I strive to follow the fundamentals of Islam and I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. I challenge any human being to point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There might be some fundamentals which someone might think they are against humanity but the moment you give the logical background there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. When we go back in history according to the Webster dictionary fundamentalist was first used to describe a group of American Protestant Christians who protested against the church. The Christian church they believed the message of the Bible was from God these American Protestant Christians, they not only believed the message of the Bible was from God, but they believe that every word, every letter of the Bible, it is the word of God. If anyone can prove every word, every letter of the Bible is the word of God, then this movement is a good movement. Whereas on the other hand, if anyone can prove that the Bible is not the word of God, then this movement is not a good movement. According to the Oxford Dictionary, fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion. And in the revised edition of the Oxford Dictionary, fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion, especially Islam. This word, especially Islam, has been added in the revised edition of the Oxford Dictionary. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, you start thinking of a Muslim. You start thinking of an extremist. I tell the people, I am an extremist. I'm extremely kind. I'm extremely merciful. I'm extremely loving. I'm extremely just. I'm extremely honest. What's wrong in being an extremist? Why are we apologetic? But we should only be an extremist in the right direction. We should not be an extremist in the wrong direction. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 208. Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. You can't say partly. 
So why are we Muslims? Why are we apologetic? We have the best deen. We have the deen al haq with us. It's time for us to turn the tables over. The third misconception is that Muslims are terrorists. What is the meaning of the word terrorist? Terrorist by definition means a person who causes terror. Whenever a robber sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the robber, the policeman is a terrorist. Whenever any criminal sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the criminal, the policeman is a terrorist. Whenever any robber sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any rapist sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any anti-social element sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Like the police, every Muslim should be a terrorist to the anti-social elements. I'm aware that this word terrorist it is more commonly used to terrorize an innocent human being. In this context, no Muslim should ever terrorize any innocent human being. Many a time, two different labels are given to the same person for the same activity. 60 years back, when the Indians were ruled by the British government, and there were people who were fighting for the freedom of the country. And these people, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. Whereas by the common Indians, they were called as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. If we agree with the view of the British government that the Britishers had tried to rule over India, then you would call these people as terrorists. Whereas, if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers had come to do trade, they had no right to rule over us, then you would call these people as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. And you can give several such examples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 6, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, in jaakum fasiqum binaba'in fatabayyanu, an tusibu qawman bi jahalah, fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimeen. O oh, you who believe, when a message comes to thee, check it up before you pass it on to the third person. We have the example of the American Revolution that took place in 17... 75. George Washington by the British government, he was called as terrorist number one. And later on, he becomes the president of USA. Imagine terrorist number one becoming the president of USA. And he happens to be the godfather of all the presidents, including George Bush. We have the example of Nelson Mandela. When South Africa was ruled by the white apartheid government. Nelson Mandela was imprisoned in Robben Islands for more than 25 years. And by the white apartheid government, he was called as terrorist number one. Later on, when South Africa gets its freedom and the white apartheid government is thrown out, Nelson Mandela gets freed. And he becomes the president of South Africa and gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine terrorist number one getting the Nobel Prize for Peace. So here we realize the media, whatever label it gives to a person, that label gets stuck to him. The media is very powerful. It can turn black into white, white into black, hero into villain, villain into hero. This is the power of the media. We Muslims, we are very backward. We need to use the same media, we have to make it halal, to strive to convey the message of Islam. And I do know that 99% things what come on the television, they are haram. But we need to use the same media, we have to make it halal, to strive to convey the message of Islam. Today is the age of science and technology. The youngsters, they are going on the wrong track. We need to use the same media to bring the youngsters on the right track. 
end. As long as we are within the purview of the Islamic Sharia, we need to use the same media. We have to make it halal to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims, to those who are unaware of it. The fourth misconception is that Islam was spread by the sword. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It is also derived from the Arabic word silm, which means to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam was spread by the sword. Peace was spread by the sword. It's rather contradicting. Each and every human being in this world, he's not in the favor of maintaining peace. There are many who would like to disrupt it for their own gains. Therefore, force has to be used in order to promote peace and justice in the country. Similarly, in Islam, force can be used at the last resort in order to promote peace and justice in the country. And the best reply to the misconception that Islam was spread by the sword is given by the famous historian Dilasi O'Leary in the book Islam of the Crossroad on page number 8 he says that history makes it clear that however the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. I would like to repeat the statement Dilasi O'Leary in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8 he says that history makes it clear that however the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world forcing Islam at the point of the sword is the most fantastic absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. We Muslims, we ruled Spain for 800 years. We didn't do the job. Later on, the Christian crusaders came and they wiped out the Muslims. There was not even a single Muslim who could openly give the adhan, that is the call for prayer. We Muslims, we were the lords of Arabia for 1400 years. For a few years, the French came. For a few years, the Britishers came. But overall, we Muslims, we were the lords of Arabia for 1400 years. Yet today in Arab land, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means Christians since generations. These 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians, they are giving Shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was not spread by the sword. We Muslims, we rule India for a thousand years. If we wanted, we could have converted each and every non-Muslim on the point of the sword. We didn't do it. Today, more than 80% of the population of India, they are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslims, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was not spread by the sword. Indonesia has the maximum number of Muslims. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia? Which sword? The reply to this is given by the famous historian Thomas Carlyle in his book Heroes and Hero Worship. And he places Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as hero number one. He says that the sword indeed, but where will you get your sword? Every opinion at its beginning, it is precisely in one man's head. One man against the whole world believes in it. One man against all men that he will pick up the sword and propagate it. Will do little for him. You must take your sword and propagate it. Thomas Carlyle is talking about the sword of reasoning, the sword of intellect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse number 125, And invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them and reason with them 
in the ways that are best and most gracious. Even if we had the sword of metal and steel, we could not use it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256, Let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Thomas Carlyle is talking about the sword of reasoning, the sword of intellect. The sword which conquers the hearts and minds of people. There was an article published in the Reader's Digest, Almanac, Yearbook 1984, and was reprinted in the Plain Truth magazine, which showed the statistics of the increase of the major world religions from 1934 to 1984. And number one religion, it was Islam, which increased by 235%. Christianity, only 47%. Which war took place between 1934 to 1984, which caused millions of people to accept Islam? Which war? Today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. Which sword is forcing these Americans and Europeans to accept Islam in large numbers? If hijab subjugates the woman, if Islam subjugates the woman, then out of the people who are accepting Islam, why are two-thirds of them women? Who is forcing them? Who is forcing these American and European women to accept Islam? I would like to end this answer with the famous saying of Dr. Joseph Adam Pearson. Dr. Joseph Adam Pearson rightly says that people who worry that nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of the religion of peace, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born.